Okay. Hi, I want to thank you all for joining us today at our CMA educational program, uh, really focusing on building brands and driving growth. And a little about myself, my name is Larry Gulko. I'm a brand strategist and growth advisor, and I've been involved in the golf industry for about 20 years. In fact, early on, I was uh, kind of a co-founder of Members First, the, um, the website company, and we were kind of ahead of our time around 2001, and I branded Members First, and I've been along with them for many, many years. But in addition to that, I've worked with clubs and uh, companies in the golf industry, uh, helping them really build their brands and drive revenue growth. Um, I've been invited to speak at many CMA conferences, either at the, um, either at the, uh, the World Conference or local regional conferences, and also the PGA show for about 10 years. And good friends with like people like Jim Singling, Mike Lemus, Matt Lindem, and others. So I'm really pretty involved in the golf industry. And I spent about two and a half months recently in Florida, South Florida, in the Palm Beach Gardens, Jupiter area, where it was good to kind of just um, reunite after two years with, with COVID and, um, and see a lot of my friends I haven't seen over two years. So it was really a breath of fresh air meeting a lot of the GMs down in the Boca, Boca area, um, Palm Beach Gardens, um, Jupiter area, Delray. It was just nice to see people again. So anyhow, um, I'm invited. I'm, I'm pleased to present my program today. And what it's going to be is a initially a presentation, a little interactivity on it as well. And also then we're going to have a Q&A, I guess we'll have to have a 10, at 11.30. So again, I thank you for, for coming. And what I want to talk about today is um, I've been helping companies and organizations and clubs build their brands for the last 30 years. In fact, recently I created a brand new program called Brand New Day Retreat which is a one-day program. And before COVID, my last client to do it was St. Andrews in Boca. And then the COVID hit. So we had to postpone these in-person meetings. And I do look forward to getting back to in-person meetings with yourselves and other people, you know, and get back to some sense of normalcy again and enjoy seeing people that we've known for years. But my program today, really, um, it's a branding journey. You know, I call it, write the book you want to read, seven game-changing strategies to take your brand to the next level. And what I'm going to talk about today has nothing to do with budget at all. It's all conceptually. Uh, well, I wanted to I want you to take a fresh look at your brand. I want you to really um, look at the brand voice. But most importantly, understand there's a big difference between having a brand name and a name brand. A name brand is a club that people want to go to. They want to join. They want to have their events there. The media wants to write about it. I mean, people want to be attached. They want to be you know, attached and, and, um, and just really involved. And a brand name is just simply that. You file a brand name and call it a day. So I'm going to go through some programs here and some tips I have, seven of them, which to me are very, very powerful. And also, in addition to what I do in the golf industry, I, I don't want to mention as well, um, I have my 19th, my 15th annual uh, CEO Brand Leadership Roundtable to have a business school tonight where we have um, three CEOs coming in. And I also have a program with Babson College supported by, endorsed by Delta Airlines, which is a CEO program as well. So I do things on the side, a lot of public speaking, but today I want to focus in on really helping you and your clubs really take your brand to the next level. So the first thing I want to talk about is that I want to show you the landscape. The landscape today is I really feel that successful brands are not great marketing campaigns. Successful brands are a result of building great business stories. And too many brands today are copying others and too many clubs are copying others. Like, I mean, we, bought, we all know a lot of clubs, you have a, a golf course, you have a grill room, maybe you have three golf courses, but it's almost like banks and lawyers. Everyone has the same thing. So it's important to create a unique value proposition that really is authentic and relevant, and it relates, it resonates to the people you want to talk to. Today, also, I find that brands need to find a focus. Um, you got to focus on something special about your club, and sometimes people have a focus and they lose their focus. The fourth uh, just landscape uh, item I want to bring up is that um, we have to do a better job at amazing and delighting our members. We have to create remarkable brand experiences. Anybody can do good or better. Good and better is easy. When you go to a restaurant and you have mediocre service, we expect that. But what can you do as a club manager to deliver the unexpected so your members are raving about your brand, raving to their friends, raving about the experience? And feel, as we're getting later, that you're a want, not a need. Like, seriously, nobody needs your club. Nobody needs me. Nobody needs a Rolex watch. No one needs a BMW. But people want it. So when people want something, they find the money and time to do it. So how can you create an amazing experience for your members so they want to keep joining, they want to keep renewing, they want to tell their friends, and they become great brand ambassadors for your club? 
And lastly, brands need to create an emotional connection. If you capture mind share, you'll drive market share. And as far as emotional connection, we focus sometimes too much on the rational, not the emotional. You know, how many clubs, we, how many courses we have, how many grill rooms, how many events, whatever. That's rational. But what are you doing to re really create an emotional connection so people feel, if people feel your brand voice and what you want them to feel? Okay. And the next slide is, this is something that I really believe in. And I really believe Ralph Waldo Emerson created what I call brand marketing in 1850. And Ralph says, do not go the, do not go the path may lead. Go and stay where there's no path and leave a trail. And is that really true? If you're going to go the path going to lead, you're going to be a Me Too brand, the sea of sameness. And when anybody might want to maybe think of joining a club, they'll take five clubs and think of the same. And who wins? The lowest price. Lowest price always wins when people feel that your club or your brand is a commodity, it's not really a brand. And unless you're at Walmart or Target, I don't want to be in the price business. So go instead with this no path and leave a trail. Be disruptive, be bold, be innovative, do things that no one's doing and have people think and feel about your brand like no other brand in the space in the world that you live in. Okay. Um, so the first tip I want to show you is tell you, tell you specialize. And it's so important to specialize and be the go-to brand in your product category. Specialists win and generalists lose. So I want to give you illustrate this, okay? I want to illustrate again, I mentioned early on, it's all about conceptually today, that everything we do today, you can take this information and bring it to your club managers or your board tomorrow and, and share with them these thoughts. Because again, it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with budget. So take, for example, Macy's. Macy's is a generalist. Right. So Macy's years ago, there's a, there a little book department at Macy's. And if you know, if people want to unmute their, their buttons, okay, I want to ask you what, what great brand grew out of Macy's in the, in the book department? Anybody want to throw, just yell it out? Uh, okay. Well, it's Barnes and Noble. So Barnes and Noble is a specialist out of a generalist store. And then you have betting. So the betting department in Macy's used to have like, you know, five or six mattresses on pillows. And what became of that? Bed, bath, and beyond. Then you go to the makeup department that had maybe, you know, they had L'Oreal and, and, and other kinds of brands, whatever, a small department. What became of that? Sephora. Okay. Then the house was the department became Crate and Barrel. And then the lingerie department became Victoria's Secret. Consumer Electronics became Best Buy. The sporting department became Dick's. And at the end, the kitchen department became William Sonoma. What I'm trying to get at here in this illustration is that generalists like Macy's will lose. So if your club's a generalist and you're offering everything to everybody, but nothing's focused, nothing special, there's nothing you want to be famous for, then you will lose long-term in the marketing game because you've got to create something that's specialized about your club. And I don't mean, for example, just having your club known for children or low handicap. I'm saying even your club, you can have sub-brands and you can brand them things, programs that nobody else has done. So again, you want to be inventive. And when people say to me, oh, we think out of the box, think out of the box is a yawner. It really is. It's a, a 1990s term. What you want to do today is you want to be creative. You want to be bold. You want to be disruptive. You'll be innovative, and you and that's how you win the marketing war and the marketing competition out there. Okay, so first in the mind wins. So you want to take a deep dive and say to yourself, you know, what do we really, um, what are we really selling? And when I say really selling, I want to show again an illustration about what you're really selling here. Okay, so for example, let's take, um, let's take Howie Davidson. Howie Davidson makes motorcycles, but Howie Davidson is selling freedom. So everything they do embraces their brand persona is all about freedom. Their yeah, website, everything. Now, other companies can say we sell freedom too, but Holly was the first in the mind. The first in the mind wins. Okay. Other companies can say they do what Holly does, but once Holly says we create freedom, then we own that. Now, the next one is Federal Express. What do they own? Well, they own overnight. Now, Emory Air Freight was the first for overnight. The post office does overnight. But Emory is the one, I'm sorry, FedEx is the one that says we're overnight. So it doesn't really matter if your competition says we do it too. The first in the mind wins. The first club, the first brand in the mind of a consumer, a potential member that has a feeling, and there's a sticky point there, will win long term. BMW, 
Okay, some people say, oh, BMW is luxury. They're not luxury. Cadillac is luxury. Lexus is luxury. Um, uh, you name it. Um, Link, Lincoln's luxury, whatever. But BMW, what do they own? The ultimate driving machine. So if you want a car that's a different experience, okay, it's a BMW. If you want just a regular luxury car, you have your pick. You have Cadillac, you have Lexus, you have uh, Co you have um, um, Acura, you have, um, uh, what's the other one? Um, my wife has it, the uh, Audi, whatever it might be, okay? So again, you have to say to yourself, what words can we own in the minds of the potential member of the member that really will drive home? Life is good. What are they selling? They're not selling T-shirts. T-shirts are an enabler. Their life is good is in the optimism, good vibes business. The T-shirts and the, and, the, and the mugs create the message to communicate with all these folks out there. And lastly, Fresh Express. You've probably heard of Fresh Express. They're the, the, the plastic bag that has salad in it, and we buy for $4.10. It is so funny today, it really is, that we are so busy today. We live in a really Zoom, impatient society that we don't even have the time to cut lettuce. We will buy from Fresh Express for $4.10 a lettuce with carrots and tomato instead of buying lettuce for a buck Foxy brand who don't have time. So they were the first. Now they were the first to create, talk about the value of an idea. They were the first to create a salad in a package. They own 78% of the market. Then Dole comes in and they want to steal their lunch. Well, as big as Dole is, we know how big Dole is. They only gain 8% market share. So eventually Fresh Express, first the market, they create the idea, they own the idea, they sold the company for a billion dollars to Chiquita Foods. But think of it, the idea, they sold a Ziploc bag of salad. Simple idea, built Britain Equity, was the first in the mind, and they, and they won. So I say to you, you know, what words do you want to own? What words can you own? And, what, and you can't say to me, well, so-and-so Larry can say what we do. That's fine. But if they're not saying it, you have the opportunity to be the first in the mind to say it. And once you do, you create a barrier to anybody else saying or owning those words. Again, it might sound simple, but there is a process of doing this. And this is what I do for a living in helping clubs define a lot of things today to really take the brand to the next level. Okay. The next, the next uh, tip I want to show you is dominate your product category. Okay. There is no substitute for innovation. You have to create a thought leadership culture that really embraces bold and disruptive thinking. When people say to you, oh, we've done it before. We can't do it. Can't do it. it won't work. They're naysayers. You don't want naysayers in your leadership team. You don't want naysayers in your culture. You really don't. They, have really, they really should be just put up on the side and forget about it. Because I have a philosophy that those who are saying it can't be done are watching those getting it done. And they really are. And so, you know, what category can you own for your club or even a sub-brand or the children's program or, or taking your, your, um, your, um, your range and making it a night program or putting fish in a pond, having a fishing day or a lifestyle, whatever. You know, years ago, and I believe, and I know you can correct me, but I remember reading studies years ago, the number one people, one, one, I'm sorry, number one, number one reason person joined a country club was golf. Then there's four other things. Today, I think you'll agree with me, Golf is like, like four or five. The first one is lifestyle, experience, could be fitness, could be food and beverage, it could be uh, community, and then there's golf. Because if you don't have a club today that's going to be family-oriented for all ages, okay, there's a good chance you won't get them as a member. Golf's important, believe me. I, I belong to two country clubs here in Boston and Cape Cod, and golf's important. But meeting people, having camaraderie, uh, meeting other couples, doing the... Doing the the, the, uh, the nine and dine, making friends is really more important, my wife and I, than the golf. We love golf, believe me. Last year, I played 50 rounds of golf. When I was on Florida for three months. We played um, 24 rounds of golf. So we love playing golf, but we love meeting people, and we love the social aspect of being at a club. So you have to say to yourself, what can we own and emotionally connect with that really is going to resonate with the people we want to talk to? Okay. Now, I want to show you an example, because people say to me, well, so-and-so can do it. Now, Tide did not invent detergent, but Tide created the first stain remover stick. So they own that category. They created the category. Other companies can say, hey, we can do that, but they're not doing it. Purell did not create disinfectant, but
but they created the on the, the portable on you know, on the wall disinfectant machine. Other companies could have done it, but they didn't. GoFundMe did not create GoFund GoFundMe did not create fundraising, but they created the most trusted fundraising platform in the world. In fact, to date, GoFundMe has raised over five billion dollars in revenue, and every week, eight thousand people create a GoFundMe campaign. So I'm just illustrating that these are not the first to create it, but they're the first to package something differently. They're the first to really break out of the box and really show people that they can create a sub-brand of what they're doing. So say to yourself, I don't, you know, whether your club is called St. Andrews or Boca West or whatever it's called, what other sub-brands can we create, okay, to really attract people and show them that we're being innovative and we're creating new ideas. You know, in the world of marketing and advertising, new and free, are the, most, are the most popular words in communications. So if, if you create something new, powerful. If you can have something free, powerful. I'm not saying free for everything. I'm just saying the word new shows that you're, you're really state of the art, you're pushing the envelope, you're, you're pushing the edge, and you're different. Because you, again, you don't want to be a sleepy Me Too club that everyone just knows who they are. You don't want to be a well-kept secret. You don't want to be a hidden gem. You want to be something special. And it's very easy if you take a fresh look at your brand and do a deep dive and spend time at it, you can create some really cool ideas initiatives that have, let's say, I'm saying if you worked with me for a whole day, one of my, my brilliant day program, the ideas that we hone in on and we're tweaking at two in the afternoon are not even the radar screen at nine in the morning. It's a journey, but you know, with the right people in the room, whatever, great things can happen. So I wanna show you this here, it's interesting. This is another thing just conceptually, Levi's, we know, is great with Levi's. Well, Levi's said, hey, everyone knows our brand. So therefore, 20 years ago or so, when it became Casual Fridays and khakis were popular, Levi's created a new brand of khakis. They created Levi Active Style. It didn't work. They created Levi Casual Wear. It failed. And I was on a committee working with Levi's that time. And I said to them, new camp, meaning, meaning khakis, new brand. It's okay to sub-brand things. So the right now, what did Levi's create? Because Levi's underestimated the value they had in the word blue jeans. So Levi's created Dockers. 99, in fact, not, what happened there? 99.9% .9 of the consumer have no idea that Dockers are owned by Levi's, nor do we care. We buy brands, we don't buy companies. So think of it, when you buy Skippy peanut butter or Philadelphia cream cheese, or Arizona iced tea, or whatever. We buy brands. The average consumer has no idea who owns them, nor do we care. So this slide's important to me because under your umbrella, again, regardless of the name of your club, you can create sub-brands. And by the mere fact you're creating sub-brands, it shows your members and potential members that you're really a marketing machine. You're constantly, um, you're constantly transforming your brand and, and as, as main club brand by having sub-brands shows that these different um, interests are these different initiatives are these different programs are really near and dear to you and they're important. And that's why you created sub brands. So look, so say to yourself, you know, what can we create that we can really sub brand within the club umbrella, the, I call it the brand umbrella. That'll be, that'll be, again, it'll be resonate and it'll be relevant to the people that we want to serve. Right. I also tell people don't try the baby the best, be the only, what can you be the only, oh, something happened, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, previous. What can you be the only at? Because the best doesn't win. And when you're the only in the area or the market or whatever, you build your reputation on capital and you build brain equity. So, so look, look again, do a deep deep dive and thought, what are we now at only? Or some things that we have that we're not really promoting, but we're the only ones doing it, but we're just not telling anybody. So you say to yourself, how can we communicate to people some of these onlys? As I mentioned earlier, you don't want to be a best kept secret or, or, or hidden gem. You want to be you want to be above the marketing clutter. You want people to know what you're famous for and what you want to be famous for. Okay. Um, you know, and you want to break the marketing clutter. Out there today, there's so much noise out there, the social media, you name it. And there's so many communications vehicles. You want to be known as an aspirational brand. And aspirational brands are brand that people want to be a part of. They want to, they want to join you. The media wants to write about you. You're a hot brand. You're, you've created brand buzz. Um, 
people just feel that you know you're 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 hot. And there's and and when you do that, when you ask for some brand, you create people, your members who talk about your club, they bring more members in, and basically the brand buzz happens. So it's important to do that. And again, as I said earlier, you want to be a want, not a need. So what can you do so people feel they want your club? And regardless of initiation and dues or whatever else, they'll find the money. Again, no one needs a Rolex watch. It's 8000 bucks. But if you want it, you'll find the money. You know, nobody needs a capital grill steak for 50 bucks. But if they want it, they'll find the money. Nobody needs to pay Risk Calton $1,000 a night for a room. But if you want it and you're going to afford it, you'll find the money. So again, I always tell people in clubs, sometimes clubs say to me, oh, you know, are we charging too much, Larry? No. As long as what your, 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 what your fee is, as long as what initiation is, as long as what the dues is, as long as what the cost of the programs are, it relates to the value that you're delivering to your members, that's fine. I'm not saying rip people off. I'm just saying sometimes people are afraid to charge a fee, a premium fee for a premium service, premium value. And if you feel that you are offering something unlike anything else in the marketplace, it's okay to charge a fee that commensurates and aligns with the value you're delivering to that member. Why not? And, and they'll be delighted to pay for it. As long as you deliver in your brand promise, as long as you deliver the value that you say you're going to deliver. Okay. Number four, it's really important. Every idea has an expiration date. Okay. You have to unlock your market. And it's really important that, again, you got to be bold, disruptive, but understand that there's, there's a date coming up. If you don't take this idea and you don't execute on it, and you don't make it happen, you don't go for it, someone down the street will, and then you'll say, oh, man, we're too late. We should have done it. No coulda, woulda, shoulda. So you have to understand, and especially today's world, where the landscape there is so competitive, and everybody's competing almost with the same member, the same customer, that you have to go for it. You really have to go for it and make it happen. And so this is an illustration that I love. It says, mine to market in 3,000 days. We've repeatedly squashed idea for almost 10 years, but now that our competitor's launching it, let's drop everything else and ship in July. Now, you might relate to this, and you might, you might be laughing, saying, you know, this happens sometimes in my club. But isn't it so true? Doesn't it fly in the face of what I just said, that every idea has an expiration date? So you can't wait 10 years. You can't wait one year. You can't wait even six months. Things are happening so fast today that if you have an idea and you feel it's going to work, you go for it. And I always tell people that when years ago, I used to do some work with Gillette and Gillette always told me they make decisions on three things, gut, instinct, and experience. I mean, I mean, research, you can research from now next five years. My, my feeling is when you have a gut feeling that tells you it's going to work, I think gut really overrides experience and research. If you feel it's right, you know, your members, you know, that, you know, the community, you, 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 your mind just says it's the right thing to do. You have to go for it. I also tell people, you know, people sometimes say, oh, you know, you have to really fail before you learn, before you learn. Well, you know, Thomas Edison, it took him 1,000 times to create the light bulb. I don't call it failing at all. You know, later on, I have a slide here, Michael Joy about failing. I call it learning. If something doesn't work, we're learning from it. We didn't fail. Your staff didn't fail. Your assistant GM didn't fail. Your, your department heads didn't fail. They're learning. We're all always learning. There's nothing wrong with learning and, and launching a product or a brand or a program or a, 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 new, um, a new event. And it maybe just don't work that well. Fine, we learn from it and we adapt. We modify it, we pivot and we do it again. But, but if you don't do that, then nothing happens, right? So I love this here. And it's so true, even with, with your people, of all the hazards, fear is the worst. I believe on the other side of success is fear and failure. People won't take a stab. They won't take a chance because they fear they're going to fail. And that's the worst feeling you can have. So as managers, I encourage you tremendously to really instill in your people. It's go for it. It's okay. Take a chance. Use your gut. Don't be quiet. Speak up. Share your ideas. Suggest things. You know, create a culture again of bold and disruptive thinking, you know, invent, be creative, you know, but if people are going to fear, 
um, it, it, it's, it's just it's just not good. You know, if we if we if we fear things, our our um, our we feel going to fail, then we'll never succeed, right? But it's all about us as managers to create a culture internally that fosters and embraces chances, taking chances and making it happen. Otherwise, you're just going to go by the wayside, and you know somebody else will keep doing what you're thinking, and you'll be joining come lately to the program. I tell people to also, when you have the opportunities and you have the capacity and capability to move, you move. Simple as that, you move. You know, today's, you know, we are living in such a crazy pace world today. And, you know, things are happening in, in nanoseconds that if you feel it's right, you really have to go for it. You really have to, because, you know, every time a member or a potential member maybe interviews, takes a tour of your property, whatever, if you have the opportunity to move, you move. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not really, I'm not really like trying to repeat myself. I'm just saying, I'm trying to instill in all you today the importance of really moving, making it happen, and not waiting six months and then saying to yourself, coulda, woulda, shoulda. And we can't drive businesses. We can't drive growth. We can't build brands. We can't build brand engagement by doing coulda, woulda, shoulda. Just doesn't happen. Okay. My fifth tip for you today is don't be afraid of being hit by a pitch. If you feel you're batting a thousand, you're losing. Clubs will say to me, oh, everything's going great. The program's going great. The youth program's going great. Everything's great. I'm not sure what else we can really do. Well, you're losing because being complacent, you will lose. Taking things for granted, you will lose. Not changing the game, you will lose. Batting a thousand means we're complacent. Everything's going fine. Why change anything? That is a recipe for disaster. I can tell you from experience, from the clubs I've dealt with, from the companies, from startup companies, to associations, to, um, to um, divisions of Fortune 500, I've seen them say, everything is fine. Why should we change anything? And three, four months later, one of the competitors steals your lunch. So you got to keep having people always thinking, what's the next thing? Now, I know not everything is going to stick. Of course not. Timing, budget, maybe it's just not a great idea. Maybe we'll look at next year, fine. But you need a pipeline of ideas to keep on a monthly basis evaluating which idea can we now unlock so we can unlock our market and we can unleash the potential of our brand. Which ideas can we prioritize in our pipeline? You should have a department or a person in charge of the pipeline of ideas. And I don't care if it's a spy, man, if it's a spy manager or the director of golf or HR or the CFO or uh, the director of merchandising or food and beverage. Everybody should giving, be giving you ideas every day of the week. And then somebody should be kind of like the idea manager and put them in a, in a, in a bucket. And every month, you and your team should evaluate the idea saying, which ones will stick? Which ones now? A month from now? Which ones maybe we just say, hey, forget it. It's not going to work, which is fine. But you need, but, but again, don't be afraid of being hit by a pitch, okay? And don't say to me or anybody, we're betting a thousand, okay? Almost like Delta Airlines uh, culture, it's, like, it's a tagline, it's a culture, and it's keep climbing. You got to keep climbing. You can't be complacent. You can't settle for mediocrity. You have to keep moving, okay? I, I want to sh share with something Michael Jordan said a while ago. And Michael Jordan said, um, let's see, I think it's cut off a little bit here. It's okay. Michael Jordan said, um, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've almost lost, I lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that's why I succeed. Now, Michael Jordan was the best of all times, right? Well, Michael Jordan succeeded in basketball, but if you recall, after basketball, he went to baseball and he failed. And do you know why he failed? Because in basketball, he had a passion and he had commitment. In basketball and baseball, he had passion. He never had commitment. So you need to have your teams be passionate and have a commitment. It's not just passion. You know, we, we see in TV all these ads, oh, passion for, um, passion for excellence, these car ads, passion for performance, passion this, passion that. That's fine. But more importantly, and passion is commitment. 
okay? And again, you know, you have to really stay fresh and say to yourself, how can we stay fresh and relevant to the, op to the people we serve and the people we wanna serve? Um, you know, Mark Cuban has a quote out there saying, every minute of the day, you're not improving your brand, building your business, somebody out there 24 seven, even when you're sleeping, is trying to steal your lunch. So you gotta say to yourself, what can we do so we can be so we can be the best at it and again be first in the mind. Okay. Number six is you want to choreograph an exceptional member experience. Ignite those around you to love and respect your brand. You know, it's interesting, but how can your how can your team members, if if, if, if people don't understand your vision as a, as a leader, if people don't understand what the brand promise is, if people don't understand what the experience should look like then how do you expect people to deliver that experience? So you have to ignite those around you to love and respect your brand and also say to you, like, you know, like, like, like what's my vision? And again, how can someone know how their role contributes to the overall role of the club and the vision if no one's told them that? I'll give you an example, okay? A while ago, um, I was in Nordstrom's and I brought some pants, some jeans back that shrunk in a weird way. And I brought them there. And then and the young kid, maybe 23 years old, said to me, well, sir, we don't, we don't, we don't really carry that color in Joseph Boo jeans. We carry beige and black, not blue. So huh. my daughter bought them for me in Washington, D.C. And I remember she went to Nordstrom's. But he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you want, I'll exchange for you for another color. So I said, hold on. So you're going to basically take my jeans back, a skew you don't even carry, and let me buy more jeans. Yes. And at that point in time, I'm thinking like, you remember years ago, like Alan Fun, Canon Camera? I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I'm on a TV show, like, how can this be? How can a store take, a, take back a brand and a color that they don't sell? And he said to me, sir, I have the ability to make you happy. You drove here for, I don't know how, whatever, how, I was a half hour, whatever. But I have the authority to make sure you're happy with any exchange under $750 without my man's experience. Okay, now this kid was great. At the end of the day, I ended up spending $400 at Nordstrom's that night. He kept showing me all these things. I remember I came home. My wife was watching uh, Grace Anatomy. And she says, where the hell have you been? And I said, I went shopping. But the moral of the story is the manager, okay, engaged the worker, okay? He empowered the worker to know what he can do and shouldn't do. And he didn't have to go like Macy's. If it happened, you know, the, the, the guy the microphone, you know, uh, manager, to um, aisle four and blah, blah, blah. And, and the manager come there and he put his little glass like this here, right? We have, we've all seen it. When'd you buy it? Where'd you buy it? Blah, 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 blah. And, and then, you know, they, they might want a blood test or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy that they put you up almost like you're, almost like you're in the um, police station, you know, being, being questioned. Oh, but the moral story is my daughter did not buy them at Nordstrom's. She bought them at Bloomingdale's in Washington, D.C. So we didn't even buy them at Nordstrom's. But the, the, the fact I'm getting at here is that you have to communicate. You have to work with your team as a team and maybe subgroup teams, like what I do with clubs, and meet with them. And we go over the brand voice. We go over the experience so everybody knows. It, communications is key, okay? But you can't allow a member of your team to uh, fail at giving an experience if you as a team, as a leader and a team member, do not communicate what the experience should look like. They're not psychics, and you can't do by osmosis. We have to really work very closely with our people and embrace them. You know, a while ago, I got a, um, an email. I'm sure you, maybe some of you guys know this person, Ed Starris. He's the VP Managing Director of Ritz Carlton in Naples, co-founder of Ritz Carlton Company. And he wrote down here at the bottom of this, um, of this email he sent me. And he says, you know, Larry, there are fact days when I never make them in my office because I go from employee to employee, guest to guest, those are far the best days of my job. And he says, every day I spend much time with my teams discussing their own guest interactions, the experiences, and encouraging them for inventive ideas. My employees come first because they don't know what, what the experience is like. How do I expect my customer to know the experience? And again, it might sound simple, but it's not simple. It's, it's again, it's discipline. It's putting a plan together and doing it on an ongoing basis. It's not a project. It's a way of life at your club. Okay. You know, I want to give you an interesting. 
uh, just talking about what, what Ed said about, you know, um, delivering on your customer experience, you know, I'd ask you folks, how much time do you spend with your members talking to them, you know, in the dining room, on, on the golf course, the spa, on the sidewalks, whatever? I mean, like, how can you, how can you personally know how to improve the experience if you don't know what it's like? So I, uh, Bain did a study a while ago on experience. 80% of companies served by Bain believe they deliver a superior experience to their customers. Then Bain asked their customers about their perceptions. And shocking, when Bain asked the customers of all these, cl- of all these companies if they agree that these companies deliver a superior experience, right for this, only 8% agreed. To me, 8% is like zero, right? How can it be such a disconnect between the ivy tower of what leadership thinks the experience is superior and a customer doesn't think it's superior at all? So again, you got to really intertwine. You got to talk to your members. You got to be a part of them. Really, the, the more time you spend with your members and your people is better than spending in the office. And give you another in, interesting uh, fact with FedEx, every 1% an increase in customer loyalty represents $100 million in revenue. Either way, if they lose 1%, $100 million. If they gain 1%, $100 million. So loyalty, member loyalty is huge. And I have, this is here, I didn't write this. The vice chairman of Disney gave to me when I consulted with Disney in the late uh, 2010, whatever. And this, this says it all, okay? A brand is a result of a thousand small gestures. It's our job as marketers to make each gesture count. We do it by creating active brand experiences using every encounter and interaction a customer has with our brand as an opportunity to show them why our brand is the best. You have the opportunity to fashion your organization where everyone's involved, everyone's fully engaged, and everyone's a player. If Disney can do this with 75,000 um, cast members in Orlando, you can do it through the club. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's all, again, people saying that marketing is result of a thousand small gestures. It's, again, I said earlier, there's nothing to do with budget. It has to do with culture and how you want to build your brand and how you want to build brand loyalty. Disney will tell you they don't care about satisfaction. They don't give a hoot if you're satisfied after a week. If you don't come back in five years, they're pissed. They really are. It's all about brand loyalty. Not If you're satisfied, you don't come back. It's not good. If a member's satisfied and they only attend a few events a year, it's not good. If a member's satisfied and they don't bring in new members, it's not good. If a member's satisfied and they don't bring in maybe an outside um, philanthropic golf tournament, it's no good. It's all about loyalty. When you build loyalty, your members are brain ambassadors. And you got to make every member a brand ambassador talking up your club of why they love it, why it's so great, and everything else involved, okay? I, I'll give an example also. You know, I'll talk about gestures. The Ritz Carlton. Again, I'm not saying you're going to go to Ritz Carlton, but Ritz Carlton, is, is a room worth $1,000? No. But if the experience is worth it, it's great. The gestures. Now, Ritz Carlton, for example, if you go to a Ritz and you want to maybe print out your boarding pass, and again, I'm not, I have nothing against Marriott or Hilton's or whatever, but what Ritz Carlton does, they say, come on downstairs, let me show you where the room is. You go to a Hyatt or a Marriott, go downstairs, the third left, after the spa, after the convenience store, open the first door, next to the ladies' room, there it is, right? We've all been there. So what does it cost for a gesture for the Ritz to actually take you to the room? When I was in Ritz Carlton in Puerto Rico about five minutes ago, giving a speech, to the Puerto Rico Hotel and Tourism Association. My daughter joined me for four days and she, she, she forgot her hairspray. And I called the Ritz and said, you have hairspray? Sure. Within five minutes, there was a knock on the door, very slightly, and they had hairspray in a bag with tissue paper with a, with a note from the manager of the hotel saying, thank you, but if anything else, give us a call. And that was great. I'm just saying, a Marriott or Hyatt or W Hotel, you want hairspray? What are they gonna tell you when you call? You hit zero, the operator? The salon opens at nine o'clock. Come back then. Again, what did it cost for its Carlton to bring the hairspray at seven in the morning? Nothing. We didn't need seven in the morning, but again, it's all about the experience. Everything's about the experience. How can we create experiences that are remarkable? Not good, a better or average. Good, a better won't win. Nordstrom has not had an, it, Nordstrom has not had a, um, a return policy in 90 years. There's no policy. 
I like Best Buy, you know, it'll say, hey, 31 days, we got you. We got you. Too bad. You're, you're one day over. We got you. Best Buy, when you go to Best Buy, they should put boxing gloves in the lobby. They won't get you. When Nordstrom says, Nordstrom treats you like you're the best friend. So again, if some of the products cost more money, it doesn't matter because you have, you have confidence. In three years, if that, if that blazer is, is ripping or the buttons or whatever it might be, they'll, they'll help you out. They treat you like best friends. They treat you like a relationship, not a transaction. Marriott says to all their hotels, their brand is one thing. Their brand is give everybody an authentic hello. It's all about authentic hello. As I go back again, I know, I know I'm repeating, but it's so important to me, an authentic hello is a gesture. It costs nothing to share and emulate and be sincere and give that person coming in who's exasperated, their flight was delayed two hours, to say an authentic hello means the world to customer. Here's the water. How can I help you out? Welcome to Marriott. Is there anything else you need? It's, it's not, nothing to do with budget. It has to do with gestures and relationships. So it's, it's just so important to understand that. And, um, you know, so after today, I want to take a, take, take a deep look, a fresh look at your brand and say, what are the things Larry's talking about that we really should plug in, whether we engage him or we do it ourselves? You know, what can we do to strengthen that relationship with our members? Because our members are really our lifeblood. And we all know that. But we're just going to do a, a better job, a greater job at showing them that they're important to us. And we listen and we hear them. And we want them to blow, we want to blow them away. We want them to give you, we, I want your members to slap you five so much that, that your hands need band-aids on them. Okay. <laughs> the last one, brand citizenship. Do good. I really believe that purpose-driven brands were in the hearts and minds of consumers. It's not just good enough anymore today to just take in revenue, take in fees, or whatever. What else can you do to do good, to be a brand citizen? What can you be doing to give back to the community? And I'm not saying just do a four-month stint and say, hey, we're going to do a, a Red Cross drive. No. What can you do? What organization or what community philanthropy or something is near and dear to you and your members? They feel good about it. And during the year, you'll say, hey, if you buy certain things, or you come to a member guest, or you buy a certain product, one portion is going to go to support our initiative for whether it be the Boca Raton Hospital, Children's Hospital, or, or the homeless, or whatever. But you have to have um, a purpose-driven brand. I was the CEO of Merck a few years ago, and he says, Larry, if you have no purpose, you have no profits. You have no business. So what can you really create amongst your people and have them all buy in and have to be a part of your DNA? Again, it's not a four-month project. It's a way of life. What can you incorporate in your brand's life so it's meaningful and your people feel so good about it. Your employees, your members, they all feel good. And, you know, they, they're feeling good because you're doing good. Um, and also try to keep company with all the leading brands. What organizations out there can you partner with that also support philanthropic endeavors that are near and dear to you, that are meaningful? You know, it's okay to grow a brand or club organically, but it's easier and much more enjoyable to not grow it organically, but identify other organizations, associations, other brands, other people in your community that you can create partnerships with that share the same values you have, that share your culture, that share your vision, and you feel it just meshes and makes for a great marriage. So try to keep company with all the leading brands, identify one or two and make it happen, and you'll really see good things will happen. Okay? Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier when we first started, write the book you want to read, envision the journey. So you got to say to yourself, what are we doing today? When people think about our brand, what are they hearing? What are they feeling? What are they saying? What are they enjoying? What do they like? What do they dislike? Where can we improve? Where can we expand our brand, more services? Or maybe we're okay, we have enough going on. We just need more people to participate. How can we do that? How can we create, how can we be a first mover and create new programs, new sub brands that we're not doing and nobody else has in the area? And if they have it, it's fine. But if they're not talking about it, again, you have the opportunity to own it in the minds of that, of that consumer or member. So that's today. And then you guys say to yourself, what are we going to be tomorrow? And then this, this today, tomorrow, then identify, you have identified what initiatives. What strategies, what planning, what ideas 
we have to create and execute to go from today to tomorrow. And tomorrow could be one year from now. I'm not saying three to five years at all. I'm saying even short-term, even short-term goals. But what do we have to do to make it happen? Okay. Um, and, you know, it's, it's also good to have a task force. Say, hey, we're going to sign three or four people from different, with different, different slices of the club, different, different operations to get together and kind of head up this little like brand development, um, brand um, propulsion, brand propelling, you know, brand equity um, uh, group. And, and they're going to be kind of the captains of really having this brand really happen. And underneath that, you'll have maybe 10, 15 people always interacting, but somebody has to own it. Somebody has to be a brand champion. Somebody has to be accountable. And I don't expect the general manager to be a brand champion. I'm sorry, I do expect he or she, but day to day to day in the, in the weeds and making sure everything's done, he or she cannot do it. So you need a good second lieutenant that can really carry the ball and make sure and bring your ideas to fruition. Because an old saying, you know, if, if you, um, an idea is called eccentric until the idea succeeds. Everybody has ideas, but if you don't put it to work, what good is it, right? So the last one I have here, this slide, so it's so cool. It's a quote from Richard Branson. And Richard Branson said, and you know, he owns 300 companies. If your dreams don't scare you, they are too small. If your dreams aren't keeping you awake at night, they're too small. You really have to go for it. You know, what, what's the worst that could happen? It's not a life sentence. Doesn't work out, fine, you learn from it. But you get you gotta happen, like I said earlier. When you have the capacity to do it, the capabilities to go to move, you move. Okay, think big. Don't think small. Anybody can think small. As I mentioned earlier, when we started talking today, there's a major difference between having a brand name and a name brand. You want to be a name brand, the brand that people want to join. They want to invite guests. The media wants to write about you. You want to have a brand buzz. You really want to shake it up. And it does not cost a lot of money to shake it up. What it costs is energy, passion, commitment, innovation, disruption, bold thinking, creating a culture of people who are in the same line. And again, if they don't know to collaborate, if your people don't know to think, being inventive and bold and disruptive, if you're not communicating to it, how can you expect them to do it in all different departments that they manage? So it's all communications and bring the whole team together and make it happen. And again, it can be done relatively quick. It can be done relatively quick, it really can, if you have the right processes and the right and the right systems in place. Okay. So in that, my last slide is um, you know, be a brand champion, build your brand to make it more appealing, more authentic, more personal and powerful. No matter how successful you are, there's always room to make your brand much more uh, resonating and a leading brand and a brand that really pay, people take note of. So I have here in the bottom my email address. My website is brandnewdayretreat.com. I mentioned early on, uh, before the pandemic, my last program was with St. Andrews, and we spent one day together, and there were uh, 25 people with me, and we were together from 9 o'clock till 6 o'clock, including a social hour, and we created five ideas and new initiatives that, again, were never even on the radar screen at 9 in the morning, and it worked. So it's a great journey. So if you do want to, you know, have an exploratory chat, I'd love to talk with you, and if you think that my Brandon Day Retreat, my one-day program, can uh, work and have value for you and your and you, you and your team members. I'd be delighted to entertain a conversation. And even if that, you want to call me for anything gratis, um, you want to chat for an hour, uh, give me a buzz. I'd be more than happy to help you. Again, I'm committed to the club business and I'm committed to helping CMAA, uh, their managers, grow their clubs. And anything I can do to add value, um, I'm here for you. So I thank you for this first part. And now I'm going to stop the sharing and we're going to have a QA and a because I want to know now what's on your minds, what you're thinking, and even besides me talking with you, the other, the other folks who are with us today, like-minded folks, other GMs, um, I'd like for them to also collaborate. So now for the next, let's say, half hour, let's collaborate and have almost like a virtual roundtable, a virtual boardroom discussion between me as a strategist and a growth advisor and with your fellow peers in sharing best practices. And let's see how, and let's see where the world can take us all today uh, until we end at 1030, okay? So I'm going to now stop the share and um, boom, boom, boom. Okay. Is that good, Beth? I think so. Yeah. 
Yes, everybody should put their um, their um, screens on speaker view at this point, and then they'll just see you. Yes, yeah, so I can see people. That'd be great. And also, yeah, and and put and put start video so we can see faces. Great. Okay, everybody, this is your chance to ask questions of, um, of Larry. Um, thank you, Larry, so much for being here today. Um, just take your phones off mute, or you can put your questions in the chat, and um, we will recognize them from the chat as well. And also at the end, with the Survey Monkey, when you log on, just use the word brand with a capital B uh, as far as the, um, the, uh, the survey today. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so far in the chat, I don't have any questions yet, Beth. But really, just speak up. I mean, like you know, and also a lot of you see your names, I'm seeing faces. So if you can just put start video, that'd be helpful as well. So all your other uh, peers can see you as well. Larry, I'll ask a question. Can you share one of the ideas? Um, or, or the categories of ideas that came out of your session with uh, St. Andrews? Yeah, um, naturally, I can't, I can't share the exact idea because it's confidential, you know, and you know, it's and, you know, so, but the thing is, uh, a few of the, a few of the, the, the things were that um, some of, some of the people at St. Andrews uh, said, you know, we really need more social events than golf related events. And we looked at their calendar and there's some social events but they didn't have a lot. They had more golf events like the dine, um, dine and Dine and Member Guest and Member Member and other events. But they said, you know, we want to meet up, we want to meet more members. So we have to create more social events. And it dawned to them for that day that social events were, were um, a much lower number than, than the events with golf. And so therefore they, they looked at their event calendar for the following year and put in more social events that had nothing to do with golf. And then also um, they talked about uh, families, the youth, again, not golf, but I mentioned earlier, lifestyle programs. And so they, they basically looked at a lot of programs that were not golf related. They're really more lifestyle experiential that they felt they could do better at. And so that's basically kind of an overview of what we did. And um, when I did that, you know, Craig Martin was the general manager and then Craig, um, I think Craig left like three months later and then Rick took over, but that's basically what we did. We, we really focused on, um, experiences that were not golf related to create more of a culture and interaction with the members, uh, not just focusing on golf. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bill Mattery, did you have a question? You started to type something. I mean, somebody must have a question, right? <laughs> You know, I, I want to mention something else. I mentioned early on about being the first in the mind. You know, you, you could say, well, all clubs in my area do what we do, but I don't really care about that. I really don't because it, it, the first in the mind is going to win. So I want to give you an example, okay? A great example. Not to do with golf, but again, conceptually. I gave a speech to the Minnesota Bankers Association in Duluth, Minnesota three years ago, and I had 400 pinstripe suit bankers with me. I was really wondering if these bankers were going to really like, jive with me or i really understand what i was talking about i'll put it to use because you know bankers have you know credit cards and bank accounts and college loans and auto loans and blah blah you know like everybody else right and so i said to them i said you know you know so he called me up two years we two years later one of, the, one of the ceos said larry i took your words to heart and we are now the college bank um the co the, the college brand of banking in duluth i said then what did you do well every tuesday night we have a little uh, two hour social hour. One night we have a psychologist in. One way, night we have guidance counselors. One, one, once a month we have, um, you know, like how to help the students prepare a resume, do interviews, uh, put a list together of schools uh, for parents, how to not become a helicopter parent. Basically, they took the college loan part of their business, one of 20, and made a big deal about it. And they were the first to do it. So they increased their loans, their applications like 34% in two years. All the other banks said, hey, we have college loans too. It doesn't really matter. The first of mine wins. So they were they are now known as a college loan bank in Duluth, Minnesota, because they did something. And what it cost them? Nothing. 
They had speakers in, they had crudite, they had coffee, they had bagels. It was petty cash. The fact is they took an initiative and they, and they educated the students and the parents at a time was very, very anxiety. I mean, my kids were out of the house, but when kids are going off to school and we're empty nesters or whatever, it's a very traumatic experience. So again, they took just one element and made it an emotional connection. And so even though, and they told me, their rates were, I think, a quarter percent more than competitors, but it didn't matter because when it came time for a parent to get a college loan, who did they go to? The bank that was there for them when they were experiencing the trials tribulations of their son or daughter, the junior high school, the next two years helping them. So the bank helped them and in turn, the bank got loyalty from those families because they were there when they needed them. So I'm saying, so I'm saying that under your brain umbrella, you can see other, you can see different programs that you can, you know, bring to the table. And so it doesn't matter to me if somebody next door has a um, down the street you, takes the range and has um, a nightly program with children and neon lights, whatever. I don't care. But if no one's promoting, hey, we're the club with that. Again, the first of mine wins. Okay, okay. Hertz was not the first rental car company, and they're not the best. Neither is Avis. You know who the biggest one is Enterprise. But in marketing, Hertz is number one. Hertz is number one in the mind. When you say, when I ask you, what's the tallest mountain in the world? You'll say Mount Everest. What's second, third, and fourth? Kilimanjaro, K2. You know why we don't know? Because we don't care. We don't care about two, three, and four. We only care about number one in the mind. You know, Motorola, yes, they invented the cell phone. Where are they today? Where's Nike today? They're gone. So the concept of being first in the mind, and I'll say it again, I don't care if 10 of the clubs do the same thing you do. If no one is bringing it above to the surface, if no one's promoting it, if no one's saying this is part of our brand essence, our culture, then you have the opportunity to do that. And then when you do it, and, we do it and, and you frustrate your other, your other competitors, hey, we do that, doesn't matter. You've already owned it like, like the bank in Duluth. You know, I'll tell you something else also, the concept of being first is so critical. If you close your eyes right now and think of the first person you kissed at age 12, or 13 or 14, I, I bet you can remember exactly who it was, he or she, where it was, where it took place. I remember myself, I remember kissing this girl. Her name was Molly Epstein. I kissed her on her, her back deck near her driveway. Her parents then drove up the, up the driveway. I was scared as shit. I ran to the forest, I ran home, and that was it. But if you ask me right now who the second girl was I kissed, whatever, I'm really serious. I have no idea. I, I, could, I have no idea because the first in the mind sticks. So what can you do at your clubs to be a first mover? Okay, take the chance. Like I said before, Sam Sneed, forget about fear, forget about failure, and go for it. And don't wait till a competitor does it and say, oh, they did it, it succeeded, now we'll do it. Too late. Larry, we have two more questions that came up. Um, one of them is, um, what are your thoughts on doing more social events that have a charity component? Huge, huge. I'll tell you why, okay? Look at the, okay, I'm gonna answer that question in two seconds. Look at products like Newman's Own. Okay, Newman's Own has, has so far to date, um, she, uh, donated a billion dollars to children's charity, mostly hole in the wall, and sadly with children challenging cancer, right? I buy a lot of Newman's own products. Yeah, I'm a marketing guy, but I'm a consumer. Barilla costs $189. Newman costs $249 for the marinara sauce. But I feel good about that brand. And I feel by spending 50 more cents for marinara sauce, I'm helping some family to stay in a hotel. I'm helping research. I'm helping some kid smile. You know, it makes me feel good. Is Newman's Zone the best products in the world? I don't know. I had the popcorn last night. So I have all the salad dressings here. Is it best? I don't know, but it tastes good. I mean, it does taste good naturally, but I feel good about it. Wilby Parker, same thing. Bombas. Every pair of socks you buy from Bombas, they give one pair to a homeless. Bombas in eight years has donated 40 million pairs of socks to the homeless. So we feel good. So to answer to your question, I would create, I wouldn't overdo it. I, I, I'd identify opportunities and events you have that you feel will align with a philanthropic endeavor because your members are going to feel good about it. And you know something? They're, you, you're going to get higher attendance because they feel good and they feel good that when they're spending $150 for an event or whatever it might be, and they know a portion is going to a charity, it makes them feel good. 
And especially, I'm not saying only children's charities. There's something about children's charities that are near dear. I mean, my, my children are knocking wood are healthy. They, they never have been saddled with anything bad, okay? So I personally, myself, I go to a lot of events. In Bo- I'm in Boston. I spent three months a year in Florida. I mentioned Jupiter, Palm Beach Gardens. I don't even give to my, my college alumni program. I would rather give to a children's hospital or a, in Atlanta, a rally for children's uh, cancer cure. I'm myself, my, I'm, my DNA, my mindset is to help out children. You, other people have other things. So if you can create events that have a charity component or whatever, it's going to be huge because more importantly, it's going to speak to the integrity and the character and the culture of your club and what you stand for. And they're going to feel proud that they belong to a club that's doing good in the community. Thank you, Larry. The next question was um, that uh, he was inquiring about clubs inside of the club. Do you see this trend continuing? And what examples are you seeing that are flourishing? And then a follow up to that was we continue to create these organizations and we are curious as to what others current are currently creating in terms of their clubs inside their clubs. Okay, when you say clubs inside a club, are you talking about book clubs and mahjong clubs and card clubs and things like that? Yes, I believe so. Okay, okay. So the trend is continuing, okay? People, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, oh, who was it? Um, oh, um, oh, George, m- both of my kids went to George Washington University. And GW, there were five students seven years ago that loved equestrian. And so the, the president of GW got three horses, went to the stable and did it. I think you have to, I think it's important. People want community. They want to be inclusive, not exclusive. I mean, myself, I mean, I don't, I don't live in a country club. I belong to two in Boston. But I, don't, I don't live right now. But if I, if I, I mean, my wife loves book club, loves Mahjong, she has all that stuff. I, it's not that I'm not friendly, but there aren't many clubs in my club, except for golf, that I belong to certain things. And I would love, maybe you should have a business club or maybe have a, a branding club or a, or a, uh, a food tasting club, whatever it might be, that the more you can do to appeal to different demographics and different interests of your club, you're going to win. But now you can't do it by being a psychic. You have to pull the club and say, hey, here are all our programs we have. Are there some that you, you know, which ones do you partake in? If we, if, if we can consider new clubs within, the, within, our, within our club, which clubs would it be? And if, and if people say, I want, a, I want a, um, a painting club, right? Or a ceramics club. And you find there's 10 people who do it. Again, it doesn't cost you any money. You have a room. You bring in some, some ceramics. You charge a certain fee and they do it. But you, you want to embrace people and include as much as possible. So again, it goes back to experience. How many experiences can you keep creating to make sure that all your constituents are loving your club? So I told you, I told, it is a trend. There's more people are joining today. And really, I have four friends just joined uh, two clubs down in, well, they, well I thought they, they joined Ibis down in West Palm Beach. And my, my friend, Jerry, he's, he's looking for more things to do. He plays golf. He's not into cards. He's not into uh, other things. He's trying to find out where else he can meet people besides in the golf course. So he, he's yearning right now for Ibis to offer some more um, clubs, activities, and he can partake, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's cooking. Maybe, I don't know what it is. But again, you have to poll and communicate. And again, embrace your membership. And, and you have to talk to them, you know, and, and think what's on their minds. Because, you know, the, the CEO of Delta Airlines, true fact, I happen to know him, okay? When he travels three hours or less, you know how he travels? Middle seat, coach. He goes to the gate, walks in the gangway, walks past first class, goes to coach. He says, Larry, how can, I says, that's my customer. Coach is the action with the action is on an airplane. How can I improve the experience, enhance it, if I'm not living it? Now, you would never think a CEO of a $58 billion company is going to be pr- and a coach. He's, he or she is going to fly in a corporate jet or first class, you know, in a martini. Says, don't get me wrong, Larry. I love first class passengers, but what do I learn from a Wall Street Journal and a glass of wine? So I mean that by saying that if Ed Bastian, the CEO of Delta, can, can sit in a coach every time he goes to the airport to meet and greet, he goes to the, the snack, he goes to the, uh, the rooms of the snack bar, he, he meets the handlers, he meets, he talks to everybody, not just executives, he goes to airports and talks to people who are, who are, who are doing the baggage. 
So I want you to go out there and talk to people, even casually, go to the grow room and say, hey, Harry, just curious, you know, we're thinking of some more clubs or whatever. Are there some clubs you and your family might want to join we don't have? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I want to... I want to I want to make flags. I don't know, but you know what I'm saying. But the thing is, marketing starts in the minds of the consumer, not in the minds of management. If you're not talking to the consumer, meaning if you're not talking to the member, you're not going to learn what you can do to enhance the customer experience, member experience. So answer the answer. Yes, do more of it because again, people join your club for a lifestyle more than golf. Thank you. Another question is, are there any or tre any trends or events that you're seeing that five-star resorts are using, like food trucks, to get members more engaged? Any new ideas that you're seeing out there in your consulting? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing food trucks. And again, this, again, they're not generalists or specialists. They're not food trucks coming with the plantas peanuts, and we have yogurt, and we have um, uh, cheese crackers, and we have and we have apples and oranges, but not that. Fiends, whether it be kebab food trucks, pizza food trucks, maybe a certain ethnic food, uh, you know, Greek salad food trucks, things that are cool. And again, I mentioned earlier, great brands deliver than expected. What can you do that your members wouldn't expect? And you're gonna wow them. They're gonna say, wow, and they're gonna, gonna go thumbs up. They're gonna love you. Okay. So I see, I see more, more I see more of those trends happening. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Beth, the last part of your question was what about the food trucks and, um, um, to get more, yeah. um, more members engaged, anything that you're seeing at resorts yeah. that you're working with that are getting more, uh, more of their, um, more of their guests and their members engaged. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing more programs where there are couples oriented. Uh, they are trying to do the best they can with youth, but then again, a lot of folks in, in Florida, uh, I'm just, my gut feeling of what I've seen like Marisol and Down Isles and people I know, you know, run those clubs, or whatever. I'm seeing that they're getting more involved in more adult social events to meet than a non-golf than just golf events. Um, and they're having maybe more like, I know in my club just came out the other day with the schedule. And for the first time we have nine, no, eight. Okay, now in October, eight, nine and dine. And, and yeah, it was so silly. One of them, one of them said nine and dine and you'll pay the fee. And then you're on your own in the grill room. And I said to the general manager, no, I, I, I didn't say I said to myself, are you nuts? The whole purpose of having a nine and dine is to meet new people and athletes come on in and schmooze, have a drink, make friends. Why do I want to go with my friends, another couple, play golf for nine holes, then go in the grill room, go find a table and sit with my friends and eat? That defeats the whole purpose. So the whole thing today is people are looking for experiences, experiences they haven't seen before, experiences that are going to, that are going to engage them. It's all about experience. We're living in an experiential community today. It's all about experiences. So whatever you can do, I believe. I'm, I think I think golf events are covered as far as what I've seen in my own club. We have member, 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 three days. There's so much golf going on. That's fine. But I have a desire to meet more people. I don't have a desire to attend more golf outings. I have a desire to meet more people. And that's for the experiences. We, we had the other day at our club, we had a trivia night. Never had it before. 90 people came. And again, in Boston, in February, trivia night. And again, the food and beverage business was, was prompt. The wine was there, whatever. But it was great. It was laughter. It was fun. So anything you do to create more experiences, anything you do to deliver the unexpected, um, again, deliver the unexpected and you'll win. Great. Thank you, Larry. I think that's the end of our questions um, for today. Hey, Beth, I, can you hear okay, me? Okay, sorry. Tim? Bruce? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is Bruce Zahn. Oh, oh, good. I just... I just have a uh, couple questions in regard to the uh, brand experience. Um, yes. A brand new day. Um, so what, I'm just curious, like who would you normally involve in, in the process? Is it just senior leadership or do you bring in uh, board members as part of the process? Yeah. And then what role do you use like as far as addressing club culture and kind of if a club wants to rebrand itself per se? And then also, finally, like what empirical data do you, you use in, in evaluating the brand? Yeah. Okay. The, fir the first question, um, Bruce, is what I do, I ask the general manager um, to identify those people that he or she, you want them to contribute, their brand ambassadors. I'll tell you an example. At, 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 um, at St. Andrews, I had the director of HR, she's been there 20 years. The director of SPA, two months. Okay, food and beverage manager, 
12 years, the director of golf, 25 years. I tell them, oh, I only want three people for marketing. This is, this is not a marketing powwow. I want slices of the club that, that you feel you, they're going to contribute. They live and breathe your brand. They really are ambassadors. And you feel that they're going to give insight that's going to be really powerful. The sec- so we do that. And so we, we meet, whatever. And I, and I start off in a program similar I just did today, because I want people that day to think how I think about building a brand. So I, I want them to leave their preconceived notion of branding out in the parking lot and come with me. I, I, want, I want them to hopefully think like I think. And in doing that, it's a deep dive. It's a very intensive day, but it's fun, it's enjoyable, it's very collaborative. And, and every GM who I've done it with said, Larry, I've never ever had these 10, 20 people ever in a room together talking about the brand. They just never, they, they, they would never be in a meeting talking about the brand and they feel really good about it. And by getting different slices of the club, different perspectives and different people, it's amazing. It's almost like putting it all in a food processor and pushing a button and the ideas come out. So it's really pretty cool. And then maybe it's like three to five ideas we're going to hone in on, we're going to prioritize. And sometimes the club will say to me, Larry, would you want to own it? Can we engage you for six months? Would you want to bring to fruition? Either we don't have time or the season's upon us or we don't have resources or talent, whatever it might be. And I'm delighted as a brand strategist to own a spearhead one or two initiatives. Because again, I don't want after the day, just say goodbye, good luck. So what I do is two months later, I visit the club again. I want to make sure you're successful. I don't want to just say good luck. I hope it works. Because that's not me. I, I want to make sure you're successful or whatever initiatives we identify is successful. As far as the metrics of defining and successful, everybody then usually puts together a, a, a mini report, maybe two pages of what they've done and showing the results. Some are quantitative, some are qualitative. Some even include quotes from some of the members of the experience. So it's basically a variety. It's really a scenario of different um qualitative and quantitative information that come back to me or them, of which we can judge, make it happen. But when I come back two months later, I, I, I come back usually maybe out of the 20 people, I might meet with seven or eight. It's not the whole group usually. The, the whole group is fine for me, but usually people are busy. So if certain representatives, but I, I leave it up to the general manager to really identify who should be there. And also on the follow-up two months later, who they want to meet with, because I, I, I take your lead. And again, it's only a one-day investment. It's not six months. It's one day. And then the day, if you don't engage me, that's fine. And and I'll see you in two months, and that's fine. But but it's not a long-term. Um, it's not a long-term engagement unless you want to engage me to spearhead some of the opportunities that we identified and we created. I, I appreciate that. I'll, I, I'll just contact you offline. I think just to kind of discuss. Sure. Thank you. I'm not sure if that's the exact direction we're looking for and looking yeah. for a little something more in depth, but. Um, Bruce, which club are you with? The Oaks Club in Sarasota. Okay. Okay. No, and also, in something, I can choreograph anything, you know, tailor it to your needs. So if you have certain objectives, whatever, I can very easily tailor. So it's not it's not a canned presentation, and it's definitely it's, it's massageable, which I can do it to to you know to align with what you want to do. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Bruce. Anybody, Anybody else? else have they'd like to ask or to um, to share. Any other thoughts? I'm here. <laughs> well, again, thank you, Larry, so much for being here today and um, committing so much time with our members. We really appreciate the fact uh, that you're so giving to our industry and to our chapter specifically. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, don't forget that in the, um, in the chat is the survey link, um, password being brand with a capital B. All of our passwords always begin with a capital letter. And um, you have until Friday to get those, those credits in. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again, Larry. And uh, thank you so much. And once again, if anybody here wants to call me, talk for an hour, it doesn't matter. If you want to, if you want to ask me a question, feel free. Um, you have my information. I'd be more than delighted. You know, no commitment at all. So if I can be of any service to help you build your brand or answer a question from my perspective, I, I'm, I'm here for you. Great. Thank you so much. Have Thank a wonderful you. day, everybody. I know season is quickly uh, coming to an end, so we look forward to yeah. seeing you at uh, some regional education meetings and uh, summer conferences. So um, have a wonderful day. God bless. Thank you. Stay well, everybody.